Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to, to welcome you to our, our uh, 43rd uh, Lunch and Learn seminar of the uh, ESSEC Philanthropy Chair. Um, my name is uh, Arthur Gauthier. I'm the Executive Director of the, of the Philanthropy Chair and the Professor at ESSEC. And we are, are together today with uh, the, almost the whole team of the Philanthropy Chair. Uh, with um, uh, our, our colleagues uh, Gaetan, Wenda, Anne, who help us organize these great uh, seminars uh, now that we switch to an online format. Um, my colleague Anne Claire Pache will join us also in a few minutes. I'm um, here. <laughs> how are you here? I just great. Hi, Anne Claire. I was just doing the, the opening um, for you. Um, uh, do you want to take the the, the say a few words uh, or should I continue as you want? Continue and I'll just say a few words. All right. All right. So um, this is the, as I said, the, the 43rd edition of our Lunch and Learn seminars. Just uh, maybe a few uh, um, housekeeping rules uh, before we start. Um, it's, uh, some of you are, uh, you know, uh, have come to many of our seminars. Some of you are coming for the first time, so just a few uh, basic rules. Uh, we try to keep cameras on and mics off. Um, it's great if you can um, right click on your name to rename yourself and probably uh, it would be nice to add your organization, the organization that you work for. It would be great for, for the this discussion. Um, there will be two ways in which you can ask questions to our two guests. Um, you can write them in the chat. We keep an eye on that, and you can select the questions. Uh, so, at, as you you know come up with questions, put them in the chat if you want, and we will uh, address them uh, as as much as we can. And uh, when we have uh, we will have some time for for um, after each presentation for questions, you can also raise your hand and use the raise hand uh, uh, button on on Zoom to to ask uh, to be uh, for for. Um, the, the, the floor and we will give you the floor. Uh, the webinar is recorded right now. Uh, you can have a replay and I'll send the replay to, to colleagues that were not able to be there today. And please uh, use our live tweet um, using this hashtag you see on the screen uh, and follow us uh, on Twitter uh, to, um, to uh, increase uh, the, the audience of, uh, of, of these uh, types of seminar. That's great. Um, we will try to end at 1.45 so that uh, everybody can go back to work <laughs> at 2 at two p.m. We're sensitive on this uh, on this issue. And um, I think uh, uh, now uh, that uh, the, the housekeeping uh, rules are, are, are done, I think I, you know, I can switch to um, the topic of the day, um, which is um, the governance of grant making foundations common pitfalls and best practices. So um, why this, um, this topic? Um, this is a, um, uh, a topic that I worked with, uh, with uh, my students uh, at the SEC Business School last year. Uh, I wanted them to work on how foundations um, take decisions and organize their activities um, and um, we realized it's a, it's a topic that I um, had worked on a few, a few years before, but it was really interesting and a, and a puzzle actually for, for students uh, because uh, they realized that um, unlike other nonprofit organizations like uh, Association uh, that we have in France, for instance, uh, foundations have no uh, members that can vote and uh, orient the decisions of the, of the, the board or the, the top management team. And unlike uh, governments, they have no electors that can uh, you know, uh, vote for a new team to, to, uh, to join the, the government of the foundation. And unlike companies, they do not have shareholders, right? Because foundations have no owners. They have founders, obviously, but the, they don't have uh, somebody or a family or an investor uh, to be chiefly accountable to. And uh, in the in this sense, um, as long as they respect the law, uh, foundations have a lot of freedom in, in order to organize uh, their governance. I mean, governance is a, is a concept that is quite common in the, in the field of um, corporations. There are a lot of books, articles about uh, corporate governance, how uh, uh, businesses, private companies should 
uh, organize uh, the relationship between uh, the board of um, you know the company, the top management, uh, how you know the responsibilities should be divided, uh, and how the, the direction of the company should be should be set up. For foundations, uh, it's a uh, it's a very very um, uh, in a smaller uh, set of uh, books, articles, and knowledge that have been published about that. Um, uh, the, the good news is that we have, uh, as guests today, two uh, people that really uh, um, helped uh, shape this uh, this uh, this field. Um, actually, uh, the the first uh, the guest uh, for today is uh, Professor Georg von Schnobein. Um, Georg is a professor at the uh, University of Basel in Switzerland and the head of the uh, Center for Philanthropy Studies, uh, which is um, uh, you know, uh, a colleague that uh, you know, we, we know well. And Georg is actually one of the only scholars uh, writing uh, um, articles in peer-reviewed journals about the governance of foundations. So um, I found his work very important um, to, to start grappling the, the issues and the questions that foundations face when they think about their decision making and how to organize their, their governance um, and when I was looking at Georg's work uh, I very quickly found the, the Swiss Foundation Code uh, that we will uh, mention a lot today. Um, uh, the Swiss Foundation Code is um, one of the most complete um, well-written and, and cited document uh, in, the, in the sphere of foundation governance um, contrary to most um, studies, reports, best practices, uh, advice, it does not come from the US um, because in the US you have quite a few um, you know, uh, guidelines published by the Center for Effective Philanthropy, the Council on Foundations and so on. But the Swiss Foundation Code uh, was born uh, in Europe, so I thought it was interesting to, uh, to have this perspective. And the um, Swiss Foundation Code is, uh, is actually uh, edited by uh, a group called um, Swiss Foundations that you may know, it's the Association of Foundations in Switzerland. And uh, Sabrina Grassi, our, our guest, is part of the board of uh, Swiss Foundations, but she's also the head of Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, which is an umbrella foundation, um, a bit like uh, our French uh, Fondation Abritante. And uh, Sabrina uh, um, is uh, in charge of uh, many uh, funds uh, that are created by individuals, people wanted to create uh, um, a foundation or philanthropic initiative. And uh, since she uh, sees a lot of people with philanthropic um, uh, you know, projects, uh, and uh, since uh, Swiss Philanthropy Foundation gives a lot of advice to structure this activity, we thought it was great to also invite Sabrina uh, to join this discussion today. Uh, so both Georg and Sabrina um, you know, are very involved uh, in uh, these questions of governance, and we are very happy to, to have them together today uh, for, this, uh, for this seminar. So, um, now that we, I presented quickly the, the topic and the, and the guests, before uh, giving the floor to, to Georg for the first presentation, um, I would like to um, launch a very quick poll. You know, we do that um, uh, all the time uh, for our lunch and lunch seminars. So if you look at your screen, uh, we will ask you the uh, uh, first question. Um, so I asked my colleague to launch the poll. Yes, so we will just introduce you to four um, principles, abstract principles, uh, regarding how foundations should be managed and governed. So you just have to, you can only select one. Which one of these four governance principles do you think is most important? The first one being effectiveness. Um, the second one, checks and balances. Transparency is the fourth option and social responsibility. So I give you a few seconds to think about that. Um, please select among these four principles, general principles that we will discuss in a few minutes, which ones do you feel is the most important? You can only select one, um, even though you probably would like to check some or all the boxes. Which ones do you think is the most important? I will share the, 
the results in a few seconds. I think uh, uh, about 80% uh, of you have voted now. Um, I'm just waiting a few more seconds. So which of these four governance principles for foundations is most important to you? And again, by governance here, uh, as uh, you probably saw in the invitation, we mean um, how the foundation is managed at the highest level and what are the sets of rules and procedures uh, that are created to, to make sure that it's the case. Okay, I think, uh, thank you so much for voting. I think we can uh, stop the poll now and share the results. You should see the results on your screen. Okay, um, I think there's a it's, there is a, a draw <laughs> between transparency and effectiveness. Um, so thank you for you know, selecting these two. I think they are you know it was a close race. Um, second comes social responsibility, uh, making sure that the foundation uh, keeps up with the, you know, how society evolves and uh, new legal issues. And checks and balances appears to be last. Um, that's uh, interesting. Probably uh, we will probably uh, um, ask Georg about uh, his advice regarding this poll. Thank you so much for for um, for participating. I think it's a good segue into our first uh, presentation. Um, I would like to uh, to ask uh, Georg von Schnorbein uh, to uh, open uh, his mic and uh, probably share his screen to, to show us some slides. I think I will stop sharing mine so that he can uh, do that. Hello, Georg, and uh, welcome. Hello, Arthur, uh, and hello, everyone. And thank you for the invitation and the, the kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, so we will talk about uh, governance, and I've really like the the outcome of this uh, uh, short question now because uh, this is sure something that we can discuss afterwards um, as we have an international audience i thought it would be helpful to start with some facts on the swiss foundation sector um, just to give you a bit a little bit of the background uh, from where our work is coming from and um, then i will present uh, shortly the swiss foundation code and then talk about these four uh, principles that we've just seen. OK, so um, when we look at the Swiss foundation sector, you can see it's, it's a sector that has uh, developed quite well uh, in the past years. So um, you see the, the dark line. It's the overall number of foundation development from 1912, when the civic code of Switzerland was established, until today. And the blue lines are the annual foundations. Um, that have been established. And when you look at this line, you see that um, from 2000 to until today, 51% of all existing foundations have been established. So usually uh, you hear, you will hear that foundations are very old and very traditional and, uh, um, and so, but this picture shows you quite the opposite. So it's a very young sector actually. And, um, Usually the, the reason why this, uh, this enormous growth has happened is because there has been a lot of private wealth around. And um, I know that there are similar um, shares of, of new foundations, uh, for example, in the US or also in Germany. Um, so this is not very typical. This is not special for Switzerland, but it's a very typical development of the foundation sector, I think in many countries in the world. Um, also, it is not, foundations are always said to be very uh, stable, so to say. But if we look closer, uh, we can say it's quite dynamic. Uh, so these are the latest figures uh, for 2021. Um, so as a rule of thumb, you can say that in Switzerland, every day one foundation is established. And so last year it was exactly 365, but we also had 219 foundations liquidated. So there's also a number of foundations that is vanishing. And um, we once looked at it and uh, the average age of a foundation <laughs> until it is uh, liquidated is 20 years. So you see um, foundations are not set up for eternity usually. Most foundations do not uh, de um, exist for such a long period. Altogether, we have over 13,000 uh, foundation, charitable foundations in Switzerland. 
And uh, so this is a very large number in international comparison. And um, probably this is also the reason why um, we have quite a lot of uh, organizations and also something like the Swiss Foundation Code in Switzerland, because there is this demand from the practice. Um, but it is important to say that not all foundations are grant making. Um, about, so the, the total assets of all foundations, uh, all the 13,000 foundations together is about uh, 100 million euros, uh, sorry, 100 billion euros. But only two thirds are grant making and most of them are rather small. So 80% of the foundations have assets under 5 million euros. And uh, in today's situation, this means that usually they don't have a lot of money to share. But they are on the other side, there are some exceptions of very large foundations that dominate the, the public awareness of the sector. Um, these uh, grant making foundations, they spend about two to three uh, billion euros per year. So, uh, and that is a, quite a figure, but uh, compared to the annual spending of the state, this is uh, not very much. The most important areas of foundations in Switzerland are culture and arts, education and research, and social services. I think that's probably the same in, in most of the other countries as well. So just to give you a small idea of the Swiss foundation sector, um, I won't go too much into um, legal issues. Uh, there are some differences, but I think generally in Europe, we can say that the understanding of a foundation is that it's it's an asset that belongs to itself and that has, uh, especially that usually has one, um, one body, one governing body, which we call the foundation board. Now, coming to talk about foundation governance, um, we can refer to the Olympics in Beijing. Perhaps you have seen a curling game and um, curling is very well suited to explain how a foundation works. So uh, in curling, you have the skip. Here it's the founder in the foundation that starts the rock. And usually the founder, the, the skip can decide what to do with the rock um, until a certain line on the field. And then he has to, get, has to let it loose. And after that, the founder cannot do anything anymore. And that's the same situation when you create a foundation after the establishment, a founder cannot change a lot of things anymore, but usually it's only dependent on the decisions of the, um, of the supervisory authorities. And then on the other end of the field, you have the, uh, the house, the so-called house, which is the foundation purpose. So the idea is that the rock, which are the assets of the foundations, get to this house. And, and then we can fulfill the foundation purpose. Now the board members, their, their task is to wipe the floor <laughs> or wipe the eyes. So they are the sweepers and um, they are not allowed to touch the rock. They are not allowed to stop it and give it a different direction. The only thing that they can do is to wipe the ice and by this um, change the speed or a little bit the direction of the stone. But in the end, it's their task that the stone reaches the house. So to say the foundation purpose. And I think this is, this is a very important remark because um, other than to, and then in other um, organizations like an association or a limit li liability company or, and, and so on, um, foundation board members cannot change the purpose of the organization. And that's uh, very unique. Now, um, Atu has already uh, talked about this Swiss foundation code. Um, the code was developed in 2005, so it already has quite some, some time uh, in, in being. And um, last year we published the fourth revised edition. So every once in a while it gets revised because uh, the situation is uh, changing, legal uh, regulations are changing, but also the practice is changing. And the idea is to have a living document and not something that is uh, becoming somehow um, old. Um, what is important, the idea of the code is not to set a rule that everybody can fulfill. It's best practice. So I don't know any foundation in Switzerland that can uh, fulfill the, the Swiss foundation code completely. But our idea was to set a, a very high le level of how to uh, do or how to run a foundation. And so it's more a basis of discussion. 
and people can use this code to um, to see what is what would be possible and pro and then decide what is necessary for the for your own foundation so it's it should help to de develop the sector and not <laughs> to cement it and finally uh, the scope of application is usually more the the larger foundations uh, so starting from 10 million swiss francs capital which where you usually have for example a paid um uh, director on the, in the foundation and not only a voluntary board. Um, but since the third edition, we also add comments for small sized foundations. But in fact, uh, most of the aspects that we mentioned are uh, account for all kinds of foundations. If you use the QR code, uh, then you get a free PDF copy. Uh, it's available in French, English, or German. And the Italian version will be available um, in the next months. Um, now, what are the core principles uh, that we have set up in, in the Swiss Foundation code, but uh, which are also um, uh, applicable to any other kind of foundation as we think? First uh, is effectiveness. So uh, the foundation um, should implement the foundation purpose as efficiently and effectively as possible, then checks and balances. Uh, this is a very important um, principle for the internal organization and structure of the organization. Transparency does not mean uh, a, an organization made of glass where you can see everything and have to report everything, but it's mainly that uh, decisions can be uh, followed after and that you know what has been decided once, uh, even if it's some time ago. And finally, the fourth principle was implemented with the last edition, social responsibility. We, we realized that um, although foundations have a charitable purpose and are oriented towards society by nature, uh, it is evident that they also have to um, develop their, their organization and their activities in every area according to the requirements of the time. So um, if you use these four principles as kind of a governance quick check, and uh, I have uh, formulated four questions based on these principles, and if you use these four questions with every important uh, decision you have to take on a foundation board, you might be already on a very safe space, in a very safe space in terms of questions if this is a good or a bad decision. Now, a little bit more information about the four principles. So as I said, transparency is about the traceability of decision-making processes. Um, one important issue of today is the disclosure of connections and conflicts of interest. Um, especially in a country like Switzerland, which is rather small, uh, you cannot avoid conflicts of interest because people that are engaged usually are engaged in many different areas or organizations. But it's important that you have some ruling how to deal with conflicts of interest. Because most times, if you, if you decide on what to do, if the situation is there, then it's already too late. Um, so what are forms of implementation, especially it's formalization and standardization. That means that, for example, uh, minutes are provided, that there is an access to documentation and so on. So, um, and it's, so this is the, the first principle. The second one, checks and balances. I was surprised that it was not so highly rated in, in the survey in the beginning. Um, checks and balances is about uh, power relations within the foundation board, but also within the organization as a, as a whole. And um, usually what happens in, in foundations or what often happens in foundations is that there's one powerful person, perhaps the founder or something, and, and all the, uh, the rest is following. And for example, if a founder dies and then the foundation board has to reorganize itself, sometimes it, it becomes obvious how powerful this one person was. So what are um, forms of, uh, to implement uh, this principle? One is the four eyes principle. That means you always have a, a regulation of control and counter control um, so that not one person can decide on too many things on, on its own. Another one is the avoidance of too many hats in personal union. That means uh, if, if someone is representing another organization on the board, then uh, and there are probably even other um, uh, connections, then it becomes difficult to really follow 
uh, or to know what which hat has the person on when there is a decision. And finally, dealing at arm's length. Um, that's also that means that uh, every if there are uh, other uh, mandates, for example, within the foundation, that it's always based on on market price. Um, effectiveness means that uh, it, it's it's a basic economic principle. So governance is also only a means to an end. You can be the best governed foundation and still uh, fail in providing your, your mission. Um, what does it mean? It's, it's especially um, thinking about the optimal size of the board. How many people do we need on the board? Um, it shouldn't be too few, but also not too many. Um, also the question of uh, what are the targets? Um, many foundations only work based on the foundation statute but uh, the statute often leaves too many um, ways open. And so it's necessary to, to focus a little bit more. And also the question of performance measurement. So uh, what, are the, what is the impact of our activities and how can we measure it or at least know a little bit what we, want to, what we are expecting. And the last one, as I said, means that uh, the foundation purpose is the major aim of the foundations, but there are other aspects of the social development that have to be respected, such as the legal responsibilities, uh, especially in the financial um, market area. There have been so many new regulations, and it's just a question of necessity to follow them. And um, in former times, that probably was not so much of an issue. Also, a question of social values, and finally, um, impact investing, which means that you can also uh, respect your foundation purpose in and in the field of uh, asset management. Um, to close, I want to uh, mention some challenges that we see in practice, and uh, probably this is something that we can catch up in discussion. The first one is board succession. As you have seen uh, in Switzerland, there are many new foundations established, but there are also many old ones. And um, all in all, there are over 70,000 board mandates in foundations usually on a voluntary basis. And so there's the question how to, um, how to re replace these people because uh, many of the foundations have been established 10 to 15 years ago. And now the founder generation gets to an age where they have to hand over to the next generation. And so this is, um, uh, this is difficult because on the other hand, the expectation on qualification and liabilities have increased. Second question is the self-assessment of the board. So the, the great thing about being on a board and of, of a foundation is that there are no stakeholders, uh, no shareholders, no members and so on who, who ask critical questions. So <laughs> you can do whatever you like, more or less. Um, but on the other hand, there are no external pressures. And so um, it's the board itself that has to improve its work. And finally, keeping a strategic focus, um, um, American found, um, researcher once said, management is more fun than governance. So every, every governance body has the tendency to micromanage. And, um, and so it's difficult um, to stay on this uh, more strategic and normative level. And uh, that's why uh, uh, you should somehow stay, uh, develop procedures to become more strategic in a board because the aims of a foundation usually are not reachable in one or two years, but probably in a decade or, or even longer. So um, I think that's all from my side at the moment, and I'm open for some questions of understanding if necessary. Otherwise I hand back to Arthur. Thank you very much, Theo, uh, for, for, for this presentation. I, I know that we uh, limit the, the... <laughs> The presentation time to about 15 minutes which is uh, both long and short you know it's 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 uh, you know long in terms of uh, attention now that we all live in this uh, digital world where our attention span is lower but it's also very short because uh, you only have uh, time to outline uh, a few key ideas but i think you did a, an amazing job so thank you georg i think we will just uh, take a, a few quick questions to to go maybe uh, to ask georg about a uh, deeper elements of this presentation before i will uh, ask uh, uh, sabrina our second guest to, to take the floor uh and claire my dear colleague you, you raised your raised your hand so I, I will give you the floor for first question 
Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you so much, Georg, for being with us and, and sharing this. I have to say I loved your metaphor with curling. I, you know, I'm not an expert in curling, but, uh, you know, the way that you explained it and the parallel that you made with the, the functioning and role of, uh, of a board, I found very enlightening. So I will keep that in mind um, you know, for future thoughts on this issue. Um, there's one thing that surprised me in the way in which you, you described the, you know, the role of the board is um, you know, the, 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 the role of beneficiary, I mean, role or at least you know, where are beneficiaries in the picture that you draw? Uh, and they are you know, in, indeed included in the notion of you know, achieving the mission, the impact, etc. Um, but, you know, we know how, um, you know, important yet how difficult also it is for um, the leadership of foundations to really understand the needs, whether it's the needs of individuals or even the needs of, you know, not-for-profit organizations that will benefit from the funds provided by the foundations. And I'm wondering, you know, to what extent in the, the, the this, um, you know, recommendations or or general good practices that you outlined, where are the beneficiaries in the picture? And I, I imagine they are maybe, you know, part of the, the discussion around checks and balances, but I would be happy to hear your thoughts on, you know, where you would fit them and what do you think would be important, you know, in the future uh, in terms of best practices um, for you know, foundation boards? Yeah, thank you. Good, a very good question. Um, so I would say the easy answer is that uh, they are they are receiving the money, so usually they cannot be uh, somehow implemented or integrated in in the foundation board because then uh, it's, there's the problem of self dealing or danger of self dealing. But on the other hand, um, we have discussions uh, in Switzerland and, and I assume in in France as well on how to democratize uh, philanthropy. And, and so um, several foundations in Switzerland at the moment uh, try out new forms of integrating uh, their beneficiaries already in the process of uh, strategy defining a definition or um, in the process of uh, selection of projects. Um, but uh, usually this is done outside of the, the, the core foundation board. So, and, and I would recommend something like that. So having some kind of a, a committee or something probably is helpful as, as, as advisors and so on, but uh, not integrating beneficiaries in, into the board. But probably we have some examples from, from the practice in the round and can share them later in the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Georg. We, we have time to take maybe uh, two, or two more questions, two or three. Uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, uh, I think I can see you in the chat. Yes, uh, Nathalie Caminade, you want to take the floor? Uh, please uh, put your mic on. It's, it's your turn if you want. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Uh, lovely, this curling picture. Um, indeed, I was wondering, um, I might have missed it. Did you set up um, bylaws, like standardized bylaws uh, for foundations? Well, usually in Switzerland, there is a there is a, a bylaw or a, or a statute, um, and and then you can set up several further um, documents on, for example, um, grant making regulations or remuneration regulations or asset management regulations. But this is all voluntary, so it's not necessary. It's not a necessity. Although, for example, uh, a regulation on asset management is today expected, also by the supervisory authorities. And, and also recommended because it's it facilitates the process for all the participants in the process. Thank you very much. Uh, Niamat Sidani, hi, uh, from HSCDS. You have a question? Yes, hello, Arthur. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for this insightful presentation. My question is more specific about family firms. Uh, I just uh, uh, read a little bit uh, on uh, the Swiss Foundation Code, the link that you sent, and I found out that there are uh, some best practices mentioned about uh, family enterprises. Um, 
is there any uh, specific uh, code for family businesses, especially that mainly families uh, go for foundations or uh, like established foundations? And my other question is that if uh, most foundations don't exist for a long time, does this explain why they are not very preferred by family businesses who usually have a long-term mission across generations? So they prefer to do this philanthropy uh, within their business lines? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, short answer. Uh, <laughs> um, in Switzerland, it's actually not so common to connect your business with a foundation because the, the legal structure is not so attractive. There are better ways to do that. Um, on the other hand, if you look to Germany, for example, or Denmark, there's quite some development in that into this direction. In Denmark, it's more or less the standard for all the international organizations uh, and enterprises to be um, family, uh, foundation based. Um, and in Germany, the, the Bundesverband Deutsche Stiftung, so the, the uh, national or federal association, they once have uh, published some recommendations on governance for family uh, foundations as well, um, to my knowledge. Yeah. Thank you, Georg. Uh, I, I see two interesting questions on the chat, so I, th I think I, I will just try to summarize them both. I, in one. I will answer them in the chat during the, the next presentation. I I, think I, that's... As you want. But, yeah. but maybe, I think there is one point that is interesting, Georg, I would like to raise is the, the we mentioned the composition of the board, so it's usually a key question that uh, we you know come across when we discuss uh, governance in general, just the, comp the composition of, uh, of governance boards. Uh, I, I was wondering uh, whether there is some specific guidelines or, or maybe uh, uh, you know, examples that you've seen in your, in your research or in your practice in which foundations try to actively um, diversify their boards because we have this uh, you know, image sometimes of foundation boards of you know, older you know, white men. Um, is it is that is this is it something that is being discussed um, uh, in, in in the context of Switzerland? Yes, sure. Um, <laughs> we we have the same discussions here and and probably the same development. So um, we have looked at all the foundation board members in Switzerland, and there are about thirty percent are women. Um, so that we can say, <laughs> further differentiations are not possible based on the fund data we have, uh, and about uh, twelve percent. Um, of the foundation board members in Switzerland are international, so non-Swiss non uh, so non residents. Um, this is probably uh, interesting. Further, um, on, the, this, on the board of single foundations, um, I'm not so aware of, of specific uh, regulations or, or codes that have been formulated, but definitely it is an issue. Um, I think for most foundations today, it's mainly the question how to implement, how to integrate younger people. And, uh, and I assume, or that's my expectation, that if more younger people come into the foundation boards, the diversity will increase uh, anyway, uh, by this also. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Georg. And thank you to, uh, to uh, Stefan uh, for the uh, reference in the, in the chat. Uh, um, Stefan, I think, uh, was one of your co-authors, uh, Georg, a few years ago on, on very uh, nice papers as well. So uh, it's good to see you, Stefan, uh, online as well. Um, okay, uh, I think to, to thank you so much. I think to keep track on the time, I will um, uh, propose to, to switch to, to, to our, our second guest, Sabrina. Just before uh, Sabrina takes the floor, I would like to... Um, to use the chat uh, for uh, our second uh, poll. So we will not uh, send you a, a, a link with the four options to choose, but just three answers on the chat. And here is the question we wanted to, uh, to ask you. Uh, in your experience, what is the main challenge concerning the governance of foundations? So if you had to, uh, you know, based on your experience as foundation professionals or um, non-profit uh, actors or, or just observers of this field. What are the main? What is the main challenge? If you could name one, what would be the main challenge uh, concerning the governance of foundations? So use the chat. Uh, take a few seconds to think about about that, and we will try to 
look at your answers and it will probably um, help um, our two guests to, to think about potential uh, ideas. So one main challenge for uh, setting up or you know, uh, making sure that the governance of the foundation is, uh, is good. Um, while you think of answers, so you know, take a few seconds and uh, it can be, uh, you know, we mentioned already the, the issue of diversity, the issue of uh, uh, making sure that the, the purpose of the foundation is, uh, is maintained over time as uh, members uh, leave the board and the foundation um, gets older. So while you think about that, please don't hesitate to, uh, to put all your answers in the chat. I will um, thank you, uh, Jean-Marc, for starting. Uh, I will um, uh, invite uh, Sabrina, our, Gracie, uh, our second guest, to take the floor. Sabrina, I, I very uh, briefly mentioned you as uh, the, the, the head of um, Swiss Philanthropy Foundation. Uh, I, I did not mention that it is a, a, an umbrella foundation. I mean, I quickly mentioned that. So I think we, you will start your presentation by a few, a few words about Swiss uh, Philanthropy Foundation. And then what is great about, um, I think your presentation is that you will give us some challenges, both from the viewpoint of uh, people setting up uh, a hosted fund, that would be uh, the uh, Fondation Abrité in, in the French uh, version, and from the uh, uh, Umbrella Foundation, Fondation Abrité. So I think it's interesting to uh, devote a few uh, minutes to understand your model. <laughs> And then to think about governance issues um, in this specific case of umbrella foundation and uh, hosted funds, because this model exists in many countries. Um, it also exists in uh, Anglo-Saxon countries with donor advice funds, even though it's a bit different. So we thought it was great to uh, to uh, to ask you to uh, detail this specific model, because many people do not necessarily have the the funds or the willingness to set up their own uh, big foundation. So they usually come to see you and see other actors to, to host the foundation. So without further ado, uh, Sabrina, I would like to, again, thank you for your time and, and uh, uh, let you uh, present uh, for, again, about, about 15 minutes. And then we will have a, a longer time for debate with both uh, Sabrina and Georg. OK. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you, everyone, uh, of being here today. I'm really pleased to be with you uh, today to speak about governments, but more on the practical side. And I'm quite happy because when I heard uh, Georg on the theoretical side, I see that uh, I will complement uh, several aspects he mentioned illustrating uh, with our reality. And I realize that we are facing everyday governance challenges as an umbrella foundation. So I think we will be, we will be to the point. So please um, let me share my screen. So I hope everyone can see my presentation. Yeah, that's yes. perfect. Yes. Yes, perfect. All right. So uh, yes, uh, I thought I would shortly, very shortly present Swiss Philanthropy Foundation because since we are not in a Swiss webinar, uh, many people might not know us. So we are, as you said, Arthur, an umbrella foundation. Uh, which is called Fondation Abritante in French or uh, similar to the model of the donor advice fund in the US, for example. Um, and so we are based in Geneva. We have been existing for over 15 years now, created in 2006. And we have been growing a lot because uh, the hosted fund model becomes more and more known now in Switzerland. Um, we are the largest umbrella foundation at the moment, but I will come to some key figures uh, at a later stage. So our mission, really, we are tax exempt. We are of public interest. We have a purpose, statutory purpose that are very broad so that we can host funds of very varied and diverse funds. And our mission is really to accompany donors and to help them create and then host for them philanthropic funds as an alternative to create an independent foundation. As you saw in the previous uh, presentation, we have 13,000 foundations in Switzerland. The, the political context is very, um, uh, very subtle, very light. It is easy to create a foundation. So the, I mean, the common 
behavior is to set up an independent foundation in Switzerland. However, in the past years, uh, the umbrella foundation model is getting more known because people realize how much commitment uh, how much time they have to dedicate to uh, not only setting up, but then to animate the foundation, to distribute, to make it effective, as we saw before. Um, so it's really the Fonds Abrité in French, in Switzerland, uh, the hosted fund is really a light, simple vehicle that is easy to set up. It is set up in two months, uh, more or less, and that uh, allows the donor or the founder to focus really on the purpose, on the distribution of grants of donations, and to be alleviated from the administrative burden because we take care of all the administration, so relationship with authorities, accounting, due diligence of the beneficiary organization. So we take that part that is maybe for a founder, the boring one, and, uh, and we help them really realize their philanthropic goal uh, for small amounts, for large amounts, uh, irrespective. So um, a few figures, just so that you have an idea. So since our inception, we have also accumulated over 300 uh, million euros, and we have been creating 76 hosted funds, of which over 50 are active today because not all funds are meant to be unlimited in time. We have funds that are set up for three or five years, more or less, but we also have funds that act as really the philanthropic um, purpose of the family, for example, and have an unlimited duration. So more or less over 50 uh, funds are active today and distributing donations worldwide to public interest beneficiary organization, public interest goal. Uh, we, we distributed nearly uh, 50 million um, Swiss franc euro last year, but in average uh, over the last year, it's 40 million um, to over 200 beneficiary organizations. Now, in terms of, uh, of donor and of people involved, because of course, as a foundation, we have, as any foundation, a board of trustees, a volunteer, and we have as well staff, employees, so management and team. But for each hosted fund, there is usually a steering committee, and I will come to that again uh, next, uh, next slide, uh, that uh, really decide the grants of, uh, of the hosted fund. And when we count all the people that sit actually in the steer, various steering committee of these over 50 funds, we are over 100 people involved. So our governance in terms of people, our ecosystem in the end is over 100 people, 133 to be exact last year. Um, we come also, we, uh, this is maybe less important, but the average duration of a fund is about eight years. But as I said, it can be very, very diverse from one fund to the other. So now maybe to come back to the structures. So there is, this is important to say, legally speaking, there is only one entity, one uh, legal personality. It is Swiss Philanthropy Foundation. And so as any public interest foundation, as is in Switzerland, we have a board of volunteers and we have an operational team with management and uh, a team we are a, a bit more than 10 people now. Also, and uh, I will explain later again, uh, in terms of organs, we have two sub organs that the board decided to create, a finance committee and a bureau. So this is really our internal governance. And then we have all the hosted funds we host, but they don't have separate legal uh, personalities, um, but they are governed by those steering committees I was mentioned, but all in all, it's one and the same entity. Now I decided to split my presentation into two perspectives, two practical perspectives, and I will start with the governance and the challenges of the governance within the hosted funds. Because I think it might be interesting uh, if we have in the audience people, uh, philanthropists who want to set up a hosted fund made in France under uh, the umbrella of a French uh, umbrella foundation like Fondation France can be interesting to understand what challenges they have. And the challenges are quite common to the one that any foundation board might have or many foundation team might have. So the steering committee, how it is composed, so it is really the question of who and what roles. So in usually in a steering committee, you have uh, the founder, uh, as long as this person is still alive, 
or their representative. And we have many times all the people that are close to the founders. Uh, in the example of families, we might have the couple, the spouse, but we might also have the children in case the children are already adults. We host family funds, if you want, where we have um, maybe two sisters and the niece and the, and the grandfather. So uh, it can also be a close friend to the family, but in general, it's really people chosen by the founder that are close to him and share uh, certain common values. And we always have one SPF, Swiss Philanthropy Foundation representative. And why is that and what are the roles? So the governance here about the roles is very clear. The, the steering committee in terms of founder and other people that have been chosen by the founder is really to drive the car, is really to define the funds approach, the strategy, and to choose the beneficiary organization. We, Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, will not be choosing uh, where to make the grant. It's really the role of the steering committee and to recommend, legally speaking, they recommend decision. And there is a, as well an interesting aspect is the decision mode. We always suggest or we advise to choose by consensus. We think it is important that people are aligned in the same spirit. However, we have funds who decided for a majority mode. We also have an example of a, a family fund with a mother and her two children where they decide, they can decide by majority up to a certain amount, in this case it's 50,000 uh, euro, and over that amount, the unanimity, the consensus is mandatory. So you can also see some, uh, some mix of governance mode, uh, but it is important to make sure how you want to decide at the beginning uh, and then stick to it in general. And Swiss Entropy Foundation role is to validate the decision because we will make sure that the beneficiary organization that have been chosen are of public interest. So we will conduct due diligence and uh, we will make sure the decision comply with the foundation's purpose. Because of course, there is a purpose for each fund that is included in the Swiss Entropy Foundation purpose. And it is important that any donation that is made really fits and is included within the purpose. So we make sure that that is respected, that the decision mechanism has been respected, and then that all decisions are duly documented. So we have minutes of the decision, which is very important uh, to, to ensure a good governance, but also because we have audited account. And in our case, the auditor picks some donations every year, and we need to prove uh, by uh, showing the minutes how uh, the decision was taken and that it was properly taken within the right uh, governance mechanism of the steering committee. And we also have funds who decide to have uh, an external support, so having guests. Uh, it can be experts, it can be advisors, uh, it could be a beneficiary organization that come and present a program. But it is very important here to ensure good governance that the guest has a, might have a consultative voice, can provide guidance, advice, or an expertise, but is not part of the decision-making process. And we make sure that this is respected. Um, now, what are the challenges we can see in the hosted fund? So I try to, to organize the, kind, the type of challenges into four categories. There is the governance of the steering committee itself. Um, most importantly, respect the founder's will. So it is easy when the founder is alive and sits in the steering committee because usually he or she has quite a strong voice and a strong place. But when the founder is not here anymore and maybe it's uh, uh, the rest of the family that is then in the steering committee, it is important not to forget what the founder wanted uh, in his or her will. Uh, it is also the case for the legacy fund. We many times ask for an intention letter to stick close as possible to the initial spirit and will of the founder. A common challenge we face is the commitment and availability of the members. We had uh, cases where uh, there were four or five people in the steering committee and one of them was never available, never came to the meeting. And this really threatens a bit the, the governance, the proper governance also in the decision-making process because this person is never there to give their opinion and to vote on, on grants. 
so it is really important when you engage in, uh, when you commit in a philanthropic um, project as uh, in a board or here in a hosted fund to really ask yourself if you have the time to commit. And then it's important to have a good, a proper distribution of tasks and a regulation of the conflict of interest. Uh, we, well, we have cases where people want to, sitting in the steering committee, want to have a mandate for advisory. So we make sure that all good governance principles are respected. So I took a bit more time on that because it's the heart of the presentation. Now uh, I will maybe go a bit faster on the other aspect. But of course, for the grant making challenges is respect the fund purpose, but also the public interest framework. Um, how the grantees were selected and make sure due diligence was properly conducted. Now we also have all the communication challenges. Of course, we have to and we want to be transparent to all the authorities we have to respond to. But there is discretion in terms of uh, the founders of the fund. And a question for the hosted fund is with, whether they want to be public, whether they want to communicate, for example, by having a website. We have several hosted funds who have their own website and communicate. And then there is all the governance around the proper management of the financial flow, of the treasury, of the accounting. And uh, in case it is important, we saw that in the previous presentation, there is more and more concern about the societal role and uh, having sustainable criteria in the financial management. Now, I wish to talk, talk about, sorry, the governance of the Umbrella Foundation itself that was before for the hosted fund. Now, as the Umbrella Foundation, how the governance is uh, organized. So as I said, we respond to authorities. In Switzerland, we have always two, the supervising authority for the governance and the legal aspects and the tax authorities to ensure we respect the public interest criteria uh, and we respect uh, the framework of our tax exemption. And now in the case of Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, we have those governing organs. So I said the board of trustees as any foundation and the role of the board is really to define the strategy and oversee governance. The role, and then the board of trustees in our case decided to create a bureau to delegate some tasks and the financial committee to supervise the asset management and make sure um, the, the assets are managed properly by the banks where they, where they lie. And of course, there is the management and the team. So it is, I think it is important to have the tasks well defined between the board of trustees that define strategy and expected results and the management that implements the strategy, follows up uh, daily tasks and also decide on activities to be conducted to fulfill the foundation purpose. And then we have also, as it is an organ officially, the auditor that uh, audits the account. We have organizational documents or statutes, so better said the article of association are mandatory. And in our case, we have internal rules or bylaws. Uh, it is recommended, I would say over a certain size. It's not maybe needed for a small foundation, but in our case, it, it became needed and we have them for the past five or six years. And internal procedures is good practice uh, when you are quite labor intensive as us to make sure you have harmonized process uh, and um, uh, that are well defined. And here the challenges, we saw many of them with Georg, so I won't be long, it's the last slide of my presentation. So uh, we saw that I think in, at the board level is really to choose the right person, so the appointments and the terms. In our case, Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, we reviewed all the terms of election of our board member and we make sure we respect the end of the terms and we conduct a re-election. So maybe sometimes we forget that we need to re-elect board members and their terms. So as a good practice, I would say to be aware of that uh, and to make sure that the renewal is conducted well. There is all the, the challenge of the succession. If we have someone who has been there for a long time or maybe is retired and doesn't want to stay anymore in the foundation, it's a question of finding someone else. And in our case, the skills are very important. So we try to have diversity in skills in our board. And then there are all the risk management issues. So in our case, we conduct an inventory of conflicts, potential conflicts of interest within the board at the beginning of every year. 
we update our risk management matrix. So we have a risk management matrix and we are actually in today updating it for the next board meeting in two weeks. Uh, the board regularly uh, started with the help of the SEPs uh, a couple of years ago, if I remember well, I conducted a self-evaluation. And uh, now it, internally, they continue to do so, maybe not every year, but I would say every two years, something like that. Uh, these are the main challenges. And then all the challenges of defining the strategic plan, in our case, it's a four-year plan. Um, and then for the team, for me and my team, to really implement the strategic plan properly. And, and then to make a review, uh, I think good practice is to make midterm reviews of the strategic plan to see if we are still following the right direction. And then I put that under communication and transparency because I think our donor need to see that as well uh, as our ecosystem, our partners. So we have a charter of good governance that has been reviewed by the SEPs many years ago already. And we have a financial management charter as well. And um, the funny thing is that we are reviewing it currently. So I think documents can also be dynamic. Governance needs to be dynamic. Uh, in our case, we want to show more intention towards sustainable investment criteria. So we are uh, reviewing in that sense. And more recently, we have been hosting funds, not for private person, but for other foundations. So we have donor foundation who host funds at Swiss Entropy Foundation to, to support the grant making programs. And they asked us, so we see there is a trend to ask some more good governance documents. So they asked us to have an anti-bribery and corruption policy, policy, sorry, which we adopted last year. And we think it is very, a very important document to have and to show that we have a certain rules. And as well, this is quite um, um, not new, but really being implemented in many donor foundations uh, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, the safeguarding policy uh, to make sure we have processes in place for our beneficiary and also internally for our staff. So, and this is the challenge maybe to not be overwhelmed by, by so many policies and documentations, not become too bureaucratic because as Georg said, we need to still fulfill the purpose of the foundation. We need to conduct effective activity and we want to be agile and efficient for our donors. So it's really the slight balance between uh, what is needed for good governance, good practice, and what we need to act to fulfill our purpose. So thank you very much. I've been a bit longer, so apologies for that, and uh, happy to answer any question you have. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Sabrina, and thank you. Uh, and you, you know, we, we, we are right on time, so no problem. Uh, and it was good to see uh, uh, to see uh, a concrete example and also the, the, the voice of a professional like you. And I think uh, it, it was interesting to um, maybe I, I will um, ask uh, both of you maybe to react to the, to the suggestions we had in the, in the chat. Uh, remember, I asked just before your presentation, Sabrina, um, what was the most important challenge faced by, um, you know, facing regarding foundation governance more generally. So we had a, a nice uh, suggestions. I will try to, to summarize them in uh, three or four broad categories. Uh, and I think all of them are related to this issue that uh, Georg raised about the lack of external pressure um, facing board members uh, in general. Uh, so I think a, a first set of answers were about the, uh, I would say the, the, the lack of information or expertise or um, uh, operational knowledge of board members. So uh, I think that was uh, important uh, for, for at least three or four um, people. Uh, relatedly, some people said that board members could uh, become uh, out of touch with uh, some realities that are out there, either um, realities facing the staff of the foundation when there is one, for instance, uh, you know, not realizing, you know, how difficult it is to raise additional funds or to uh, measure the impact with, uh, with rigor, uh, but also 
the, the risk of being out of touch with uh, evolutions uh, in society. And uh, uh, this speaks to the uh, issue of uh, representativeness of board members that was raised by two uh, of our participants. Um, and I, I, I think, yeah, that's most of the uh, answers were around this, uh, these topics. Um, Georg and Sabrina, maybe we can briefly uh, comment about, about these suggestions. Georg, you, since you introduced this idea of uh, insulation from external pressure, what do you think of these uh, suggestions? And then I will ask the same question to, to Sabrina before leaving the floor for all your questions. Uh, well, thank you. I think it's, it is an, a very current issue and uh, it has to be solved somehow. The difficulty usually is that, that um, I mean, with 13,000 foundations, you have 13,000 different foundation boards. So it's very difficult to, to set up one rule or one way of doing it. Um, and, and as I said, I think it's to some part, it's a generational prob um, problem or <laughs> uh, question. And, and um, there will be some change when usually, what we see is if there is a change uh, of board members, then usually something in terms of board structure and also board uh, um, composition is changing. Um, on the other hand, um, what is also important, and I think someone raised it as well, is the role of the founder. I mean, the, 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 sp the special thing about philanthropy is that there is someone who was willing to give away his fortune for some social cause with some idea. So I think it, it needs to have a balance between the two. Uh, and, and this should not be forgotten on the one on the other hand, um, that you always have to rely on the foundation founders uh, ideas. Um, but sometimes, but it has to be interpreted. So I think that's, that's also important. Uh, the, if a foundation is set up 30 years ago, um, the, the world was different. So you have the board of today has to think about what does it mean? And, and that's exactly what we meant when we established the, the principle of social responsibility of foundations in the Swiss foundation code. Uh, you cannot say, well, we are a foundation. Our founder has said 30 years ago, this has to be this and this. And that's why we do it like that. That's, I think that would be too easy. So it is, it is a demand for the, the board to, to think about it. Yeah, and in the case, uh, just before letting uh, Sabrina answer, in, in the case of France, for instance, for uh, at least for the Fondation Reconnue d'Utilité Publique, which is our most uh, ancient and uh, uh, protected status of foundations, uh, the, the representatives of the state uh, can intervene uh, in extreme cases when they think that the, the, you know, the founders will is uh, either not relevant anymore or does not match uh, what is uh, considered as public uh, interest today. So, um, you know, in, I guess in Switzerland, the, the, the state does not intervene, right, for, for these types of issues. Well, it can. There is all, there's a state supervision authority and they can intervene in term, if they think that the board is not, uh, so it does not fulfill the purpose. But it's really an ultima ratio, so it it takes a very long time until this happens. So usually, it's it's the responsibility of the board. Yeah. Thank you, Georg. Uh, Sabrina, a quick comment on the, the suggestions from the participants regarding the the, the key challenges. Well. Um... In terms of the purpose, also to rebound on what Georg said, well, we have less concern because our funds are quite recent, so obsolescence in our case is not um, is not really a, an issue. Our most of our funds have maximum five or six years now, so uh, the purpose is still right to the point. What I can see, what I can see though is founders who wanted to have a specific purpose. We we don't advise that. We say the more generic, the best, better it is, then you don't need to support any field, but at least legally you can. And we have the case where uh, the, the founder and the family around the founder wanted to be quite specific, supported one type of health issue and uh, the integration of uh, disabled persons in certain uh, professions. And then there was the pandemic and they, they wanted to, to do other kind of supports and they thought they could, they didn't think of the purpose anymore. And we had to, and this is our governance role, we had to remind them that they had chosen a certain purpose and, and it was in this case limiting them 
So, uh, so this is a challenge we see that over time, not to forget the initial purpose you wanted because it is not something you can change as you wish and you need to stick to it. So a generic purpose is really, really advised. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know if you wish to that I answered all other aspects of this. Oh, no, that's, that's great, uh, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a good comment. We, we have uh, now time for, for more questions uh, to uh, either Georg or Sabrina or both. Uh, so please uh, either raise your hand so I can give you the floor or you can still use the chat to, um, to send your questions uh, to, to our guests. Uh, we have about uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, left. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours now. Um, and Claire, you may want to break the ice since I'm, I see no other hand raised. Go ahead. And I don't want to be, you know, uh, using all the um, all the space, but I indeed have a, uh, a burning question that builds upon some of the things that have been discussed and some of the comments that appeared in the in the chat related to, you know, the need for having a diverse board composition uh, to ensure that you know multiple perspectives are taken into account. And I would like to you know, share uh, the results of one study that I conducted in the field of social enterprises, uh, looking at their board, board composition, and how it impacted the ability of these boards to really you know, focus uh, their attention on, on the, the dual mission of the organization. And what we found is that indeed, you know, you, ideally you want to bring a diversity of people on the board because you want to ensure that they will bring different perspectives on, on the mission. And you know, in the case that I studied, it was looking at both the social dimension of the organization and its more commercial uh, aspects. But what we also found is that if you have that diversity on the board, then it's more likely that you will have some conflicts because people you know, that are, have these different expertise may, may see the world with a different lens and may then uh, you know, disagree when it comes to deciding on, on some of the core, um, you know, aspects of, of the foundation's activity. Um, and so we identified in, in this research project, you know, ways in which these conflicts can be avoided by, uh, for instance, uh, you know, working hard on the so socialization of the board members, making sure that, you know, we, um, you know, that, that the people with a business background are socialized into social goals and that people with a more social or you know um, like specific expertise will be also socialized into the more financial dimension um, i mean a more you know, financially oriented view of the world i'm wondering whether you know both georg or sabrina in your own either experience or in your own research you've seen similar dynamics happen on the foundations of on the boards of foundations, and you know whether you've seen interesting ways in which this potential, maybe not conflicts, but tension that may come with the diversity that is thought on the board, can be mitigated. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I can answer shortly, perhaps. So um, I totally agree. I mean, the, the more heterogeneous a board or a group becomes, the more conflict uh, potential is there. Um, but probably we have to we have to f finish with with some of the cliches about how to run a foundation. And one of the cliches is that there has also always have to be uh, unanimity in in decisions. So um, the ideal is always that. Um, everybody is uh, that it's a bunch of friends and they they work together and everybody knows the same way in the, the same direction and probably that's not the reality and uh, in reality it would be probably better if if there is discussion in the board because then you avoid having discussions afterwards um, if you if you don't have any crit critical questions in the board on a project or on a program um, they might be raised afterwards by the public. And then uh, the risk of reputational uh, problems and so on is much larger. So why don't include these discussions in your board and have it internally and then find a solution and probably not everybody is, is agreeing on it, but, but then you, you can move forward. And um, so, so I think that's uh, in how to mitigate it. It's probably one, one solution from my point of view is that, um, that you um, do not expect so 
unanimity always in every decision and um, that the board um, really tries to, to level out uh, power relations. So what often happens in foundation board is that one or two persons have the say. And by, for example, dividing, um, for example, let's say discussions on, on projects. And if every board member has his or her share on preparations on, on specific projects, then they, um, then it's not only one person that is saying, okay, we have this uh, this board and we have, oh, sorry, we have this project and now we have to decide on that and I'm uh, against it or I am I want to support it. And then the decision is more or less done. Uh, I think it's better if um, everyone on the board has something to say and ha has something to, to add to the discussion. And by this uh, um, conflicts might be mitigated a little bit because it's not always one person that is dominating. Thank you. Well, what, what I, can, I can say from experience, one thing as well in practice, many boards choose the board member by co-optation. So even so you seek for diversity, in reality, many times you, you still find people to whom you feel aligned, right? So, so I personally have not experienced strong these alignments in board, but I have experienced different opinions. That's that's for sure. And I think then it's also a question of uh, of uh, arguing. I mean, of uh, presenting arguments and also on re of trust because you rely also on the skills of the board member. Of course, if the question is about finance you will rely more on the expertise and experience of people who have the financial background. If it's on projects and, and beneficiary related issues or grantees, then you will rely on the, on the board members that have more experience on project management or grantees relationship because maybe they, they come from this background, you know? So it's also, I mean, you see in a board that some people endorse some roles and have opinions and maybe are respected for those opinions. And even so, maybe there is not unanimity, there will be a majority. And in the end, there is a trust that a common, you know, trust that, that things will go in the right direction. Um, so yes, I think you can, you can still, uh, I mean, you can discuss and agree to, to certain directions and then you can realign if further on you see it's the, it was not the right decision and you need to, to change uh, the, yeah, the direction. Um, Maybe if there's no other question, then I'll have a follow-up um, question, you know, on this notion of trust. Um, you know, boards are in foundations as in other any other organizations uh, have a very specific functioning because they meet, you know, only, um, you know, occasionally for a few hours. So, you know, building trust among people that, you know, rarely see each other and that don't have the time that you may have, you know, as professional, you're working every day, you can, you know, get to know each other, understand it the perspective of, of, of colleagues. When you're sitting on the board, it's like, you know, building trust uh, within two hours every three months. That's not that easy. Any thoughts on how you achieve, how you know, one could achieve, you know, trust among board members in foundations? Sabrina, from the practical perspective. <laughs> <laughs> But sorry, can you rephrase the, the last part about trust, the, the exact question, because I don't want to. No, because you said, you know, what is very important mm -hmm. is the trust that, uh, you know, exists within mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the board. And I'm, you know, just observing that when you look at the board, you look at the team that meets one every, I don't know exactly how it is in, in your context, mm -hmm. but that meets only occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, for a few hours. So it's a group that mm -hmm. actually doesn't spend that much time together. Mm -hmm. and so my question is, how do you build trust mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. among such a group that, you know, mm -hmm. it's occasionally and that doesn't mm -hmm. interact that much? It's easier, you know, when you're uh, talking about a team that meets every day, you know, mm -hmm. for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. How do you build trust in, mm -hmm. in such a group? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking this question. So, um, well, of course, it will depend from one foundation to another. We Our board meets four times a year, so it's already more than certain others. But what we, we've tried to, to do in the past years, and I think it uh, works quite well, for example, is to hold a salon, what we call salon. We invite uh, an external guest, uh, expert in a topic, uh, which is of interest to the foundation. So we had experts in questions of uh, legacies or uh, tax questions or, uh, you know, um, also another umbrella foundation, like we invited once the, the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisory to speak to us. And this creates, because this is a presentation and then we have a space of question and answers. And this really creates a space for the board members to, to exchange and to get to know better. Uh, we also had the practice in our board session uh, when they are not virtual to also invite a guest and to have really a conversation, a dialogue. And this helps a lot. I would say what can also help, uh, we did it uh, and we are going to resume it now that it's again possible. It's not necessarily to hold the board meeting just uh, like a, meet, uh, a work meeting in two hours, you know, it's really to, to do like a retreat. And in our case, our board was meeting twice a year from the Friday evening to the Saturday afternoon. And there was also a dinner for informal exchange and then uh, four hours meeting the next day that with breaks that really allowed for more exchange, more conversations and to get to know each other better. So I think it's everything you can create around that just going a bit beyond just a formal work session and try even to have guests or conversation. Thank you. I think we have one more question uh, from uh, Colette Coribra. You raise your hand. Please uh, ask your question if you, if you want. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, great. I have a question. Um, do the expectations of the foundation toward the grantees have evolved over time, do you think? And if yes, how uh, has it impacted the governance of the grant making foundations? Do you want me to answer, girl, or you want first? No, no go. <laughs> No, no, what, what we can see is the founders, the donors want to create more impact, so they really want to know how the money is used. It's not like uh, we, we say in French, the chèque en blanc, as may, might have been predominant before. So, so now really is the question how the money was used and what did the grantee do of the, uh, with the, the grant or the donation. So uh, there is an expectation for more reporting. Uh, but what we try to avoid is to have excessive reporting because you can't have the grantee like overwhelmed with reporting and answering questions of the donor and not being able to conduct their, their philanthropic activities, you know, so this is also a sensitive balance to have, but we, we see that there is interest in really following uh, the grantee asking for reporting on the donation, we see also an increased interest this is mainly from donor foundation for uh, capacity building and organizational development and really strengthening the grantee to not create any uh, dependency and to really have the grantee becoming more and more autonomous and, and, and self-reliant. So I know if that answers your questions, but, uh, but it's a bit the trend we see and our role as a umbrella foundation is really to, to find the right balance uh, between ensuring good governance, knowing how the money was used, but not getting overwhelmed by excessive bureaucracy. And it's also in this frame that I was mentioning the safeguarding policy, which is uh, very important, but you need to be careful what you are asking to report to your grantees and, and what is asked to the Umbrella Foundation, because with over 200 grantees, it's quite a lot. Yeah, I, I, I might add that, uh... I think the, the relationship between foundations and their beneficiaries in general has developed more into a partnership. Uh, and in former times, it was more paternalistic so that you were giving money and you expected some thank you for that. And today it's probably more in a partnership, but this also means that there has to be more exchange and more, more time invested into this partnership, into this relation. Yeah, and, and I think it speaks to uh, new uh, questions and issues that are raised in the nonprofit sector about how can uh, foundations and, and, and funders be uh, 
you know, not only pressuring the, the grantees and the entrepreneurs on the ground to more reporting, like you said, uh, Sabrina, or just short-term, uh, you know, uh, uh, expectations. I think it's important to, uh, so that this partnership is maybe more horizontal than vertical, because uh, if there is this pressure for more uh, short-term uh, results, I think it could be detrimental to some of the work that is being done on the ground, which requires also a long-term view. Um, okay, it's, uh, it's almost, uh, 145. So uh, I would like to uh, to thank uh, first Georg and Sabrina for their for their time and for their great presentation and for having this conversation with us uh, today. I would like to thank uh, everyone in the, in the chat, the participants, for for your insights. And uh, we will also uh, you know, we we share a few resources uh, in in the chat as well. Uh, for closing, I think I will ask uh, Anne Claire, my colleague at Carpage, to uh, to take the floor and to uh, uh, give us a few updates on the on the philanthropy chairs uh, activities as well. Anne Claire. Yes, thank you, thank you, Arthur. Of course, a, a big big thank you to Georg and and Sabrina. Georg has been when we launched the the chair at ESSEC uh, a few years ago. You know, the center that uh, Georg had created was. Uh, a real inspiration. So it's great to be able to, to welcome him today um, in the context of this um, lunch and learn. So, you know, thank you all for participating. It's great to, to see that the, you know, the, the online formats uh, still works really, really well and we will uh, continue working with it. We are, you know, working on the organization of the next lunch and learn. We'll keep you posted as soon as we, we have the, the theme and and, uh, and speakers lined up. Uh, a few important information. Um, so you know you may be aware that we organize in December uh, a big event for our ten years anniversary, and so we have now um, a video for those who were not able to make it. A video that somehow summarizes what happened during this uh, this event, and so Gaetan is currently putting it in the in the chat so don't hesitate to to go and check it uh, and during that event our colleague Anne Monnier um, presented a, a very vibrant um, you know tribune for research and research on philanthropy specifically and now um, a podcast has been made on this uh, on this uh, tribune so um, you will also you know either find it on our uh, website or it will also be shared in the in the in the chat uh, you know alongside all the other podcasts that have been produced in the past months on uh, on this topic it's it's really worth checking it if you haven't done so yet um, and so you know a bientôt is all that we want to tell you enjoy your afternoon thank you Gaetan and Gwenda uh, for the very smooth organization of this uh, of these seminars, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye bye. Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir. Merci. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.